did the sun stop moving in the sky? In the book of Joshua, it records that the Israelites were fighting an important battle with the Amorites. You might have heard that what it records is that to help win the battle, Joshua asked God for the sun to stop moving in the sky so the day would not end and Israel could finish the battle and defeat their enemies. Modern readers scoff at this idea. If the sun stopped moving in the sky, it would mean the earth stopped rotating, which would create disastrous effects around the world because the atmosphere would have kept moving. Massive tsunamis and apocalyptic windstorms would have resulted that would have likely killed every person on earth and destroyed every man-made structure. Thus Joshua must be recording a myth and cannot be literal history. But perhaps the problem is we have read this passage in our modern culture and with our modern understanding. If we look at the language the ancient writers used, we can see Joshua is not at all recording the sun literally stop moving in the sky, and we've been misinterpreting this passage for centuries. Joshua 10 says that Israel went to fight a battle against five Amorite armies and to defend their allies at Gibeon. When they arrived, it records this. At that time, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Sun stand at Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? The sun stopped in the midst of heaven and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. There has been no day like it before or since, when the Lord heeded the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. Many take this to mean the Bible records the sun literally stopped moving in the sky. In the context of the ancient Near East belief system, the sun stopping in the sky would not have been physically impossible. Since the ancient cultures believed the earth was flat, and the sun was a much smaller object that moved around the earth. But for over 2,000 years, we've known the earth is definitely round and moves around the sun. If the sun stopped moving in the sky, it would mean the earth temporarily stopped rotating. And as we noted, such an event would have had massive consequences, including winds of such high speeds that would likely have killed everyone on earth. Yet Joshua seems to record the sun stopped moving and Israel merely finished the battle without experiencing any natural disasters. Some Christians have argued that God could have miraculously stopped the earth from rotating while also miraculously preventing massive natural disasters from occurring. But then we need to ask, why would such a thing not have been recorded by any other ancient culture? The whole earth would have seen something that had never happened before. It should have been mentioned on the walls of Egypt or in ancient Mesopotamia. If the sun stopped moving for a full day, why was nothing about such a unique astronomical event ever mentioned in any ancient inscription? The modern interpretation is that Israel was winning, but the sun was about to set, and therefore, both sides would have had to stop and wait for daylight. To prevent this from happening, Joshua prayed the sun would stop moving so Israel could finish with their victory. But this interpretation doesn't make sense with the actual text because it says when Joshua uttered this, it was in the morning. Joshua 10.8 says the men of Israel marched all night, so they would have arrived at Gibeon in the morning. It also says the sun was over Gibeon and the moon was in the valley of Aijalon. With Israel in the middle, this would place the sun in the east, not the west, meaning the sun was rising, not setting. This alone would refute the idea that when Joshua uttered this prayer, it was because he was worried the sun was setting. Based on what the text says, it had just risen in the east. So why would Joshua pray such a thing when they already had a full day to fight? The idea Joshua was worried the sun was setting doesn't actually make sense with the text. The scholars John Walton and Mark Shavalas say in the ancient Near Eastern context, Joshua is not claiming the sun literally stopped moving. Instead, he was merely using the language of almonds to destroy the morale of his enemies. We tend to think in terms of physics when we read this passage, but they were speaking in terms of omens. In numerous ancient texts, we read the timing and position of the sun and moon were seen as important for the outcome of battles. In fact, in these omen texts, we see language of the sun and moon stopping, standing, or waiting. First, ancient cultures of the Near East determined the beginning of a month by the appearance of the new moon. When the full moon appeared, it would help determine the length of the month. 
In fact, for a few minutes in the morning, when the full moon appeared, it would be with the rising sun in the sky. So the celestial objects would have been seen in the sky together. Now if the full moon appeared on the 14th day, it would have been considered a good omen and the proper length of time. Months that were 29 days were considered hollow, while months that were 30 days were called full. Thus, if the full moon and the sun were seen together on the 14th day of the month, it was considered a good omen and a sign of good things to come. One omen reads, If on the 14th day the moon and the sun are seen together, the speech of the land will become reliable, the land will become happy, the gods will remember Akkad favorably, joy among the troops, the cattle of Akkad will lie in the steppe undisturbed. If, however, this event occurred on another day, or weather prevented anyone from seeing when the sun and the full moon were together, it was considered a bad omen. To quote, If on the fifteenth day the moon and the sun are seen together, a strong enemy will raise his weapons against the land. The enemy will tear down the city gate. If on the thirteenth day the moon and the sun are seen together, unreliable speech. The way of the land will not be straight. There will be footsteps of the enemy. The enemy will take away booty in the land. Omens like these were considered to be extremely important in determining the outcome of battles, and also for determining the day on which the battle should take place. If the battle took place on the wrong day, with the timing of the sun and the moon off, it would be considered bad and assured that their army would lose. And this is likely what is taking place in Joshua 10. Joshua asked God for the sun and the moon to appear on a specific day and in a way so that his enemies would interpret it as a bad omen. What is interesting is in Joshua, we see similar language to what is found in almond texts. These texts often refer to the moon waiting for the sun. It does not mean the moon literally stopped moving so the sun could catch up. It refers to the moon still being in the sky when the sun rises. We also see texts, as it is in Joshua, stating a celestial object is standing over certain places. Walton says, The words stand and wait or not do not refer to taking up specific positions in the sky. They refer to the coordinated movements of the celestial bodies in the given context. For example, we see omen texts refer to certain celestial objects standing. If the field star comes close to the front of the moon and stands there, variant, there will be an attack of the enemy. If the old man star comes to stand close to the top of the moon and enters the moon, the king will stand in triumph. If the sun stands in the halo of the moon, in all the lands, people will speak the truth. The sun will speak truth with his father, universal peace. If the moon stands in a stable position, waiting for rain. Interestingly enough, we see another text that sounds similar to what we read in Joshua. The heavens continually rumbled, the earth continually shook, the sun lay at the horizon, the moon stopped still in the midst of the sky. In the sky the great lights disappeared, an evil storm, the nations, a deluge swept over the lands. In Joshua 10, the key verbs are translated as stand still and stop. Walton notes the Semitic range of the Hebrew word for stop also includes the meaning of to wait. Therefore, the language of Joshua 10 fits with omen texts, which speak of celestial objects standing and waiting. In the ancient Near Eastern context, Joshua is asking God to have the sun and moon appear in a way that would dismay the Amorites. The sun and the moon may have appeared on the wrong day, and the Amorites would have seen this as an omen, meaning their defeat was imminent. This is supported by the fact that it says the Amorites fled before Israel when they arrived. Some might attempt to argue the phrase used in verse 13 refers to the sun's setting, and so it was the evening when this event happened. Walton responds by noting, the Hebrew verb used here regularly refers to the setting of the sun, but that does not mean the setting is imminent. For the time that the sun rises, it is moving towards setting. Since the sun is in the east, this is simply to be understood as another way of saying that the sun waited or stood. Another argument is that Joshua 10.13 seems to speak of the sun and the moon acting, and so fulfilling what was spoken to them. In other words, it seems to suggest they stood in their places until Israel was victorious. But Walton notes the Hebrew does not necessarily say that. In Joshua 10, in contrast, Ad is followed by the imperfect form of the verb meaning avenge. It is very unusual, seven occurrences, for the preposition Ad to be followed by an imperfect verb form. 
In fact, one of the major Hebrew lexicons isolates these seven passages as representing a different word entirely from the preposition usually translated until. In other words, the passage should read as, O sun, wait over Gibeon, and moon, over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun waited, and the moon stood before the nation took vengeance on its enemies. The resulting situation was not the sun and the moon standing in the sky, but the omen, which had an enduring effect as the victory unfolded for Joshua and Israel. Some also argue it could not merely be a bad omen, since verse 14 says, There has been no day like it before or since, indicating it must have been something very unusual. But the text says what was unusual, and doesn't state it was because the sun and the moon literally stopped, but that the Lord heeded the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. In other words, what was so unusual was not the movements of the sun and moon, but that God accepted the battle strategy of Joshua. God heard a man's request and made it happen for Israel. That is what the text says was so unique about the day, not the movements of the celestial bodies. When we interpret Joshua in its ancient Near Eastern context, what we find is that it fits well with ancient texts regarding omens of celestial bodies, and does not mean to state the sun and the moon literally stopped in the sky. This would be like a future historian reading a newspaper headline from today, stating the sky was falling, and interpreting it to mean that we literally thought the sky was like a ceiling and could fall on us. But if he would take our cultural context into account, it would be known that this was merely an idiom and not a literal belief about the sky. And likewise, we need to interpret the book of Joshua in its ancient Near Eastern context. It is not claiming the sun stood still, but that a bad omen appeared on the wrong morning and broke the morale of the Amorites.